This video is sponsored by Mantis Sleep. As someone who tries to get their 8 hours of sleep most nights, but often fail, I needed to try something new. So I tried the Mantis Sleep Mask Pro, and I gained that precious extra hour, and sometimes even two, right away. I think what's most impressive about this mask is how comfortable it is. Considering I'm a crazy sleeper, my do-rag falls off every night, but given the design, the mask is never going to fall off. I then tried the cool eye cups and they had my eyes feeling refreshed in the mornings. And they don't press up against your eyes like other masks sometimes do. In addition, Mantis also got a slim sleep mask, a mask for kids, and even a sound sleep mask with Bluetooth headphones built in them. So if you are interested or you need a new sleep mask, try out Mantis Sleep. You can visit the link in the description and you can use the code SAGE for 10% off your order. And there's also a mid-year sale going on right up until the 13th of this month. Again, the link is in the description, and you can use the code SAGE for 10% off your order. Kind of the, the whole vibe of this film is, is the mundane and the fantastic, you know? The entire film is riddled with similar contrasting ideas and viewpoints. And some of the strongest dichotomies highlighted in this movie are between Bob and Helen, the mundane and the fantastic, and the idea of mediocrity against the exceptional. The parallels between Bob and Helen are placed from the very beginning of the film, as far back as them being Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, from their contrasting black and blue and red and white designs, but most notably in their hero interviews where Bob suggests that he'd like to have a simple life, maybe relax a little and raise a family, he says, whereas Helen completely blows this idea off. Of course, we know that these roles are reversed 15 years later, when the government shuts down superheroes everywhere. Bob struggles with being regular, as he can't conform his mind or his body to these small cubicles, the tiny car, the small home, and the monotony of his everyday life, the insignificance of it all. On their wedding day, Helen told Bob that in order to make their relationship work, he will have to be more than just Mr. Incredible. But 15 years later, it's difficult. Helen, who can literally contort her body, has embraced and accepted that the world wants her to fit in. She doesn't really have a greater desire to be super anymore. Being a mother is what she is wholly dedicated to, but that also has its challenges. Her children both want to revel in their abilities, but also desire to be normal. And it's her duty to make her kids understand how to navigate the internal conflict that they have to live with. Helen has to help them find joy in their version of normal. And all while this is happening, her husband faces an identity crisis. Their arcs parallel each other. Bob has to accept and embrace the mundane, while Helen has to embrace the exception. Bob's desire to be something more begins to touch upon selfishness. He reaches his limit. Bob feels that every day he isn't out there being exceptional, he's being further pulled down into the world of mediocrity. And this all comes out after Bob gets home late from undercover hero activities. Bob airs out his frustration with how their world has transformed. They keep creating new ways to celebrate mediocrity, but if someone is genuinely exceptional, this then... While Helen has accepted the change and is now trying to put her children's well-being first, as she doesn't want to force her children to have to move once again. The two make good points in this argument that penetrate each other's viewpoints, but neither is willing to concede and find a middle ground. Bob's selfishness is the main point of contention here, and Helen is absolutely in the right to not want to uproot their children's lives once again, just because of Bob's desire to relive the glory days. This is not about you! But Bob does mention a desire to let Dash compete. To let their child be great, he says, because ultimately that is the reason why he's acting out in school. While Helen is concerned about their children's physical and emotional well-being, she doesn't have an answer for the fulfillment that her children are seeking. They are all trying to adapt to a world that does not want them. After this, Bob suddenly doesn't mention any of these frustrations again. In fact, his life gets much, much better. The new car, the suits, the rejuvenated love life, Suddenly things have changed, until Helen begins to have her doubts. Her suspicions obviously point to her fear that Bob is having an affair, but what makes it particularly sad is that this affair is clearly connected to being a hero again. 
as she notices his old suit stitched up. It's precisely the one thing that Helen cannot give Bob, the one thing that she cannot change. But if someone is out there giving him that opportunity, making him feel like a hero again, it's a bit of a losing battle for her. The way this film marries the mundane and the fantastic happens right in front of our eyes. While Edna questions Helen and Bob's relationship, the scenes are cut and juxtaposed Bob on no man's land, catapulting from tree to tree, hiding not only from Syndrome's henchmen, but from his wife as well. Helen calls the insurance company Bob worked at. My records say his employment was terminated almost two months ago. At the same time, Bob looks at all of these heroes that have been terminated by Kronos. This is followed by the slow pan to Edna's face, asking Helen if she would like to find out where her husband was. The music swells and reaches its crescendo right before she presses the button, and Bob gets caught. It's all just excellent writing. Both of these events feel like they carry equal weight. The family drama feels just as, if not more important, than the hero work. It really does highlight the mundane and the fantastic. Helen is so apprehensive about re-entering that whole world once again, now that she has children, and she's completely justified in doing so. After finding Bob's location, learning that he's got a new suit, she's now more worried that her husband is in genuine danger rather than it just being an affair. And when Dash and Violet sneak onto the plane, this is the worst possible outcome. The aircraft, the rockets, the danger, the evil, all of this is what she never wanted to bring to her children. Maybe this is what it's all been about. Yes, she feared getting relocated and uprooting her children's lives, but at the end of the day, being a hero is incredibly dangerous, and for children with no experience, it's basically a death wish. After surviving that first attack, she's forced to be honest with her children about what might come, and once again she has to balance the mundane and the fantastic. She has to balance being a mother and a hero. Helen has to remember what it means to be a last girl. She has to be brutally honest with Dash and Violet, and yet trusting and caring, given the situation. The fantastic and the mundane. The reason why the family is caught in this situation in the first place is because of the desires of the citizens. This whole superhero relocation program stems from people's jealousy of the supers. Rather than actual harm that they've done, Mr. Incredible first gets sued because the man trying to end his own life did not want to be saved. He then gets sued by the group on the train whom he saved. None had life-threatening injuries. The newspaper highlights a super arrested for simply having the ability to see through walls, not for any harm done. It seems as though over time, people became insecure, unhappy with their own mediocrity, and wanted to bring those who were special down to their level. Where does this jealousy stem from? Nietzsche would argue that the non-supers carry what he calls a slave morality, which he most commonly used against religion. As opposed to the nobleman or the master morality, which is naturally strong, self-affirming, creative, the slave or the commoner is weak, psychologically and physically. The slave morality develops to resent everything the nobleman is and has. In order to come about, he writes, they need external stimuli to act at all. The commoner's very action is a reaction. The philosopher writes that this resentment eventually turns creative, and the weak then take action against the nobleman a slave revolt, because they too wish to be strong. They want the confidence, the pleasures, the benefits, and the assuredness of the nobleman. While Nietzsche criticizes the two moralities and hope for a newer one, he is much more critical of the weakling. To further understand the mindset, Nietzsche suggests that if a nobleman notices someone else has something he wants, rather than resenting that person, he is instead inspired to make himself worthy and capable of acquiring such goods himself. If a nobleman does feel resentment, he is able to feel it and let it pass. It does not poison them. The weakling, however, does not rise to the challenge. It is only out of resentment that he becomes creative. We see this happen with the citizens in The Incredibles. Supers are not oppressive, nor are they puppets of the government or a private capitalist company like the Heroes of the Boys, for example. They genuinely use their abilities for good. They are heroes in every sense of the term. And yet, out of resentment for maybe the superhuman abilities, the glory, the fame, or the privilege that the supers have gained from the government or the public, they still aim to tear the supers down. Again, to bring them down to the level that they are. 
In the essay on American exceptionalism in The Incredibles, Mino writes that when the public coerces superheroes to be like everyone else, when corporate life demands to surrender talent, individuality, and the greater good to the lubrication of the business machine, and when the supervillain hopes to make everyone super so that no one is, The Incredibles illustrates the threat of the tyranny of the majority in a 21st century text. Syndrome and his quote embodies the very resentment that Nietzsche points out that exists fundamentally in the weak morality. Syndrome is the most egregious example because he has the tools to elevate regular citizens. He has the money, the genius, to invent all of these gadgets that can elevate the quality of their lives, and yet he refuses to. Imagine if Syndrome gave out all of his gadgets to the regular civilian. They wouldn't have to suffer at the hands of greedy insurance companies and other capitalist institutions. Instead, Syndrome makes weapons and he sells them to other countries. His priority really isn't that everyone becomes super, but instead that he becomes the only super, a desire he gained out of resentment for Mr. Incredible and the rest of the supers. Syndrome only wants what they had, the fame, the praise, the glory. He doesn't carry their most important trait, their true and honest desire to help others, their sense of duty. And it's even worse for the villain because he once understood supers more than most when he was a child. Well, not every superhero has powers, you know. You can't be super without them. And yet he still can't be anything more than that child that he once was. Despite being shunned by humanity and shut down by the government, the Pars still continue to fight for mankind, as only kindness and sympathy can combat the insecurities of the general population. Even if it costed them their freedom, they were willing to be super, to save their fellow citizens. So, the family banding together, putting their differences aside to save each other, and using their powers in unison, proves their dedication to truly being super. This conclusion goes against the notion that The Incredibles is a Randian film, as it explicitly goes against all notions of individualism, from both Mr. Incredible and Syndrome. It's Bob's selfishness that puts his whole family in danger, narrowly avoiding death, and Syndrome ultimately losing and failing places the narrative against any individualistic belief. To close Bob and Helen's arc and their parallels, balancing the super and the mundane, when they confess their love for each other after fighting off Syndrome's henchmen. Oh, I love you. Bob realizes how much he cares for his family and for his wife, and he apologizes for his selfishness. And Helen is given a taste of the glory days, and a reason as to why she fell in love with Mr. Incredible in the first place. Helen is reminded that she is a super for a reason, and she should embrace that. Helen has forgot about her own greatness in pursuit of being normal for her family. They each learn to embrace and appreciate both the fantastic and the mundane. The couple continue to grow and work through his insecurities to the point where he can finally be honest about his fears. And to combat that, Helen proudly proclaims that they are supers accepting her true nature and later her children's desires to be their most authentic selves. Audrey Anton points out that in the end, even though the world is made aware of the importance of supers and the dangers of mediocrity, they are still forced to tone themselves down to appease the non-supers. He says, quote, Perhaps Bird subconsciously felt pressure to provide a normal ending where all of our children can maintain the illusion that they are as fast as Dash. Perhaps the film argues that, yes, it is important to embrace what makes you different and to strive to be exceptional, but it shouldn't be done at the cost of the people that matter. Being different or being great at something does not mean that you are more valuable than others, and if you aren't super, that doesn't mean that you have less value than those who are. Which is what I think Syndrome felt that day Mr. Incredible pushed him to the side. Perhaps the film argues that, instead of trying to bring those who are super, those who are exceptional, down, we should instead strive to be exceptional in the things that matter. Being an exceptional friend, an exceptional parent, an exceptional human being. Yes, if everyone is super, then no one will be. But if everyone truly is super and tries to instead emulate the duty to others that the supers carry, everyone's lives would improve. The reasons the supers are super in this film is not only because of the physical advantages they possess, but it's also because they are able to rise above whatever resentment, anger, or hatred is thrown at them, and they can still continue to move forward. Even if they have to submit and cater to the whims of those who are different from them, they are willing to do it. 
because they can still find value and allow themselves to be exceptional when the time calls for it. Though they might not get celebrated in the eyes of the public as Bob once lamented, at least now, within the eyes of their community and their family, they can still celebrate each other's gifts. For the Parr family, embracing the fantastic when the time calls for it allows for the mundane to thrive. And at the end of the film, we see how embracing this side of them, being the truest, most authentic selves, we see how it affects both Dash and Violet and their happiness and their confidence. Even when no one wants them to be, they can still be super.